Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to our discussion today with Professor Serhii Plochi on Russia's war on Ukraine, the return of the empire and the nuclear threats. I'm Ed Schatz, director of the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies here at the Monk School, the University of Toronto. And be, on behalf of Saris and the Petroyatsik Program for the Study of Ukraine, we're truly honored to have such an esteemed guest who is perhaps the world's leading historian of Ukraine. Before I introduce Professor Plochi, let me take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. As most of you will know, for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are indeed grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Professor Serhii Plochi is Mikhailo Khrushchevsky, Professor of Ukrainian History and Director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University, where he has been since 2007. Before that, he taught at the University of Dnipropetrovsk, which is now Dnipro, right? Um, and at the University of Alberta. But before I continue, um, allow me a brief aside. I was reading this morning about a scientific study that concerned exercise and longevity. And the finding was that people who achieve what the study calls breathlessness, that is they have difficulty speaking while exercising, live longer. Well, covering Serhii Plochi's accomplishments will certainly prolong your life. By my count, Professor Plochi has published 16 books in English, including, okay, deep breath, here goes. The Cossacks and Religion in Early Modern Ukraine, Oxford University Press, 2002. Tsars and Cossacks uh, Study in Iconography, Ukrainian Research Institute, 2003. Uh, with Frank Sisson, Religion and Nation in Modern Ukraine, Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, 2003. Unmaking Imperial Russia, Toronto, 2005. The Origin of the Slavic Nations, Cambridge, 2006. Ukraine and Russia, Toronto, 2008. Yalta, The Price of Peace, Viking, 2010. The Cossack Myth, History and Nationhood in the Age of Empires, again, Cambridge, uh, 2012, The Last Empire, Final Days of the Soviet Union, this one by Basic Books 2014, which won the Gelber Prize, uh, which is, uh, you know, I think you were in this room, right, uh, seven years ago for that, for, that, uh, for that award ceremony. The Gates of Europe, History of Ukraine, Basic Books 2015, Lost Kingdom, Quest for Empire and the Making of the Russian Nation, Basic Books 2017, Chernobyl, A History of Tragedy, Alan Lane, 2018, Forgotten Bastards of the Eastern Front, Oxford, 2019, Nuclear Folly, History of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Norton, 2021, uh, The Frontline Essays on Ukraine's Past and Present, uh, Ukrainian Research Institute, 2021, and, whew, breathless, uh, Adams and Ashes, A Global History of Nuclear Disaster, New York, Norton and Company, 2022, and uh, Professor Plohi will be available to sign some books outside, and they're available, I believe, for sale, right, um, outside uh, after our talk today. A great friend of Ukraine, of Canada, of Saris, and of the Monk School, but most of all, an historian who is truly world-class. Sarah, we're delighted to welcome you back to Toronto. Uh, we wish it were under entirely different circumstances, but we look uh, forward to hearing from you and learning from you uh, uh, on this important topic. Professor Plokey will have the floor for 40, 45 minutes, whatever you see fit. And then our own uh, Professor Robert Austin, which is Robert's over there on the side, will, uh, who is himself a, uh, an eminent historian of, um, of Central and Southeast Europe, will moderate questions from the audience here in the room and at home. Professor Plokey. Well, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for this wonderful and warm, warm introduction. I'm really happy to be to be back in Toronto uh, and see old friends and and hopefully make new ones as well. Um, when uh, um, Professor Austin suggested uh, this this visit and this talk, um, I was. Uh, trying to put together again, the, the, the topic was one of the discussions. It was very clear. We met already, it was second or third, third month of the war, that war is something that on everybody's mind. And uh, I believe that we historians, we can provide some perspective on that war and some understanding of that war that otherwise was missing or is missing today. 
Uh, but then there was another another theme that was quite quite new, at least when you look at the history at the history of the disintegration of the empires, formation of the modern nation states. That issue was nuclear, and uh, uh, the nuclear, the return of the empire, and the nuclear threats are the two things that are linked together, brought together in the title of today's presentation. But it is also, in my opinion, this is, this is something that really very much defines the key features, the key characteristics of what is, what is happening today in Ukraine. Uh, back in the, in the um, year 2000, a uh, prominent uh, historian of the Soviet Union and of Russia, Stephen Kotkin published a book which was called Armageddon Averted. And the point of the, of the title, at least, if not the book as a whole, was that uh, the Cold War ended with the disintegration of the Soviet Union and didn't end with the nuclear war. So that was, that, that, that was the premises of the title, that was the premises of the approach as such. And one thing that we see today is first that the fall of the Soviet Union is not an event. It didn't end with Mikhail Gorbachev's speech on December 25th, 1991. The process of the disintegration of the Soviet Union and post-Soviet space in many ways only started at that time and, and that point. And that the uh, Armageddon was not entirely averted, but maybe postponed because what we see today is return, not only the story and the history that started in 1991 or even earlier, as I will try to show, but also the return of the nuclear threat that wasn't with us for more than, uh, for more than 30 years. And Ukraine is at the, at the middle, at the intersection of these two processes. The old and traditional one associated with the disintegration of the empires, the wars for independence, the story that begins at least since the American Revolution, and these processes, the processes of the fight for independence are happening now in the nuclear world, the world that is relatively new, at least for, from, the perspective, from the perspective of a historian. So let me see now whether I can master the PowerPoint. I can move it on my screen, but I can't do that on your screen. And uh, I wonder whether all the connections are in place or not, because I have a couple of images that, okay, that's, now we got it here. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, again, when, when, we, when we talked and discussed the topic and the time, uh, we, we couldn't predict that the nuclear threats would, would become so explicit as it was only a few, as it happened only a few days ago. When, when Vladimir Putin did in one speech three things at the same time. First, he uh, declared so-called uh, limited the mobilization, which again, most of the observers believe that this is a mobilization that will be not limited uh, in any way and not 300,000 people, but probably million or maybe more than 1 million. The second thing that was done was that he um, suggested that the so-called uh, referendums that they are preparing on the uh, territory of the occupied parts of Ukraine would not only go ahead, but would be recognized as legitimate referendums by the Russian Federation. And the third thing that he did, he threatened the West and he threatened more specifically Ukraine with the use of the nuclear weapons. And here we are really, really in a different, in a different place because uh, the former imperial power suggests that it can go and occupy parts of uh, other countries, the former, former parts of the colonies or peripheries of the, of the empires, declare them to be part of that, of that former empire, and then use nuclear weapons against, 
against any country that challenges that uh, new reality in violation, of course, of the all international agreements, including uh, the agreements, uh, Budapest memorandums and others in which the use of the nuclear weapons by a nuclear power against non-nuclear power or even threat of the, by the use of the nuclear weapons is, is prohibited. Um, the uh, disintegration of, of the Soviet Union, which is closely related to the, to the Ukrainian independence and the process that was in, in many ways triggered and started as the result of the Ukrainian drive for independence uh, came uh, at the end of the Cold War and in the Cold War and end in the arms race between the United States and uh, the Soviet Union. But there was also another very important nuclear theme and very important nuclear topic in the story of the disintegration of the USSR and of the Cold War and the rise of independent Ukraine. That part of the story was called Chernobyl. And uh, uh, the story of Chernobyl is extremely important, not only for the, for the course of the Cold War, in which it has been claimed at least by uh, um, Mikhail Gorbachev himself, that he rethought his thinking about the nuclear war. Um, asking whether, whether the Soviet Union could actually survive a nuclear attack if the accident at Chernobyl turned out to be so, so um, dramatic of events, so difficult to deal with. The consequences were so, uh, um, so lasting and, and so devastating for the, for the Soviet economy. But there was another even more important consequences of Chernobyl. And this is the fact that Chernobyl really brought to the fore the movement in Ukraine, but also in other Soviet republics, in particular in the Republic of um, uh, Lithuania against the center, against the Soviet center. The uh, Lithuanian movement for independence, the organization, which was called Sayodis, was born out of mobilization against the nuclear power. After Chernobyl, 20,000 people surrounded the Ignalina nuclear power plant, the power plant that probably is known to the majority of you because of the HBO miniseries. That's, that's where they were shooting the film about Chernobyl. It was a, it, 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 it was a um, twin sister power station in Ignalina to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. And in Ukraine itself, the first mass manifestation in Ukraine, in Kiev in particular, that took place in 1988, uh, over 10,000 people was over the issue of Chernobyl and nuclear power. And uh, the Ruch, the movement for independence of Ukraine, comes out of that mobilization a few months after, after this mass manifestation. And if you look at the, um, what uh, Vyacheslav Chernovil and other leaders of the Ruch were saying at that time, what they were writing at that time, they were acknowledging the direct link and direct, direct connection between the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, the, the accident there, and uh, the rise of anti-nuclear and pro-independence movement in Ukraine. Um, Chernobyl reactor was a very particular type of reactor. It was a so-called dual purpose reactor, which means that it could be used for boiling water and producing electricity but it also could be switched and used for the production of plutonium. That was one of the reasons why the regime of secrecy surrounded what was happening at Chernobyl. And Chernobyl in that sense is really, really a symbol where the so-called atoms for peace and atoms for war come together. They came together in the place called Chernobyl. And in that sense, the role of Chernobyl in mobilization, Ukrainian independence, the role of Ukrainian independence in the end of the Soviet Union and in the end of the Cold War is really, is really difficult to overestimate. This is a photo from the, or image from the uh, HBO miniseries about, uh, of course, Soviet media completely 
um, being silent about about what was happening at Chernobyl, and this is this is the uh, image of uh, Ukrainians celebrating their independence in uh, August of 1991. Now, the uh, Chernobyl accident had a major impact on Ukrainian thinking about not only independence, but also about the uh, sort of a country that Ukrainians were building in the early 1990s. Uh, the uh, Chernobyl uh, suggested to many Ukrainian politicians at that time that nuclear energy in its all manifestations from the nuclear power stations to the nuclear bombs was basically a, um, an evil force, something that Ukraine didn't want to be associated with. The original idea was that Ukraine would have to give up, first of all, on the nuclear energy. The parliament accepted a moratorium on the um, construction of the new, new nuclear power plants. And the idea was to phase out nuclear energy altogether. And another idea was that Ukraine should become a non-nuclear state. And the reason for that was also that if Ukraine would insist on continuing to be a nuclear state, that would make it much more difficult for the country to acquire independence and more specifically to acquire the international recognition for that independence. So let's leave nuclear energy behind, let's leave nuclear weapons behind, and let's move toward our independence. That would be easier to, 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 to achieve. And uh, that, was, that was pretty much the, the Ukrainian position up until the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union. One week after the Ukrainian referendum on December 1st, 1991. The um, agreement that was signed and, and, and the understanding that was achieved at Belaveja in December of 1991 was first that the three republics, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus that were most affected by the, uh, by the fallout of Chernobyl would work together dealing with the consequences of the disaster. And the third one was that Ukraine and Belarus would give up their nuclear weapons. That was the message that was delivered by uh, President Yeltsin of Russia when he was calling uh, uh, the US President, uh, George H.W. Bush, from the, from the um, uh, from, from Belarus at that time. Uh, Ukraine at that time starts rethinking its relation to the nuclear weapons. And the key, the key reason for that was the worsening relations with Russia. Because the model that the new denuclearization acquires in 1991 and 1992 was that the United States preferred to deal with the evil they knew or the devil they knew with Moscow. So the idea was that all Soviet nukes from Kazakhstan, from Ukraine, from Belarus would be moved to Russia. Not, 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 not removed from those countries and go to, to third countries, they would be removed to Russia. And the position that eventually President Kravchuk and people around him take that we actually can do that. In the conditions where Russia starts making claims on the Ukrainian territory. And the first of those claims was already very soon after the coup in Moscow in 1991, in late August of that year, when the spokesperson for uh, President uh, Yeltsin, Pavel Vashanov said that if Ukraine decides to leave the Soviet Union, Russia has the right to raise issue of the borders. And when he was asked what borders, what did he have in mind? Crimea and Donbass were specifically mentioned. That was August of 1991. By May of 1992, there is a big issue going on over the uh, Navy, over the, over the Black Sea Fleet. Who has the right for Black Sea Fleet? And the issue of the Crimea is raised also as the 
uh, as the um, major major uh, problem in relations between Russia and Ukraine by no less a figure than at that time, vice president of the Russian Federation, General Rutskoy, who in April, late April of 1992 makes uh, public statements claiming Ukrainian, Ukrainian uh, um, sovereignty over its territory and Crimea in particular. This is May of 1992, exactly the time when the United States forces Ukraine to sign non-proliferation, uh, to join the non-proliferation treaty as a non-nuclear state. So Ukraine is forced to give up its uh, nuclear weapons, not at, at some point in, in, in time where, where it doesn't have any threat. It is forced to do that at the moment when Russia advances its territorial claims on the Ukrainian territory. Um, which means that, that uh, Ukraine tries to resist. And the best, the best what Ukrainians were able to get at that time was first the compensation, financial compensation for the nuclear weapons that they were giving up. And second, after they stopped uh, moving their nukes to Russia, saying that they, they were not going to do that, given that it makes Russia stronger and it, it's, it's, its claims on Ukrainian territory more credible, the idea was that the Ukrainians were allowed to accompany those nukes to Russia and see and oversee the process of their destruction and conversion of the uh, uh, plutonium and uranium into, into a form of the fuel that can be used in the, in the, nuclear, power, uh, in the nuclear power stations. Uh, Budapest Memorandum became, became um, uh, at the end, the, the final, final document that was signed already not by Kravchuk, but was signed by Kuchma where Ukraine and other post-Soviet countries like Kazakhstan, like Belarus, received not guarantees, but assurances of their territorial integrity and sovereignty. Um, and uh, uh, the, the world moved on. The, the problem, the threat that was posed by allegedly loose nukes on the territory of the, of the Soviet Union of former territory of the Soviet Union uh, was allegedly resolved. Just a sec. Now, what the Budapest Memorandum really did? The Budapest Memorandum created a security vacuum in the center of Europe. So by removing a deterrence in nuclear weapons from the country on whose territories claims were made by the neighboring country, by the nuclear power, it made, it created this security vacuum. It made Ukraine vulnerable to a degree that it was not vulnerable before, before 1994. And the problem was that no substitute was really provided in terms of the assurance security of the country and the region. So the, the one way to think about the Budapest Memorandum is to imagine the uh, security system in Europe in general as a brick wall. Then someone comes and actually punches a huge wall, a huge hole in that wall by removing the nuclear weapons from Ukraine. And then you put on that, over that wall a wallpaper called Budapest Memorandum and declare that everything is okay, that the wall is there, it continues, it performs its, its function. Now, what, what could have been done? What else could go into that wall if, let's say, the nuclear weapons were removed from Ukrainian territory? What would, would be the, 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 the substitute? What would still protect Ukraine? under the circumstances? Well, the answer was provided by the uh, Polish, um, Polish politicians in 1990 and 1991. When they told uh, the visiting American, American um, uh, officials from the State Department saying that 
first we want to be members of NATO. If we are not members of NATO, we would have to look for the alternative ways of protecting our sovereignty. We would have to start developing a nuclear program of our own. So from the perspective of at least part of the Polish political establishment in the 1990 and the early 1990s, the security guarantees were coming either with the membership in, the, in NATO, and that's where Poland eventually uh, joined NATO, or with the um, control over and possession of the nuclear weapons. So in Ukraine, the nuclear weapons were removed. The NATO moved to the, to the Ukrainian borders and stopped there. The worst thing that could happen at that time happened at the Bucharest Memorandum in the year 2008. When uh, Ukraine was uh, uh, under President Yushchenko at that time, it was suggested that Ukraine can actually apply for NATO at, at that summit. But then the summit had a discussion and under pressure of Russia turned down that request. So Ukraine publicly in front of Russia and everyone else manifested its desire to join NATO. And the NATO publicly in front of everyone else said that Ukraine is not joining NATO at some point in the future, but not now. So the, the, country, the, 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 the um, joining NATO at that time was already perceived by Putin as a direct threat to Russia. And rejection of Ukraine as a potential member of NATO made, uh, meant that Ukraine was left completely, completely uh, exposed to, to, to the threat or to the potential war. A few months after the Bucharest summit of 2008, uh, Putin starts a military campaign, a war against Georgia, another country that had the same aspirations as as Ukraine. So immediate response to the Bucharest summit, to the failed attempt and, and public, public declaration of the, uh, of the intentions of joining NATO and public rejection on the part of NATO of this, of this aspirations. So um, the, um, war in Ukraine that comes in 2014 and then becomes all out war. Earlier this year in February of 2022, at least in this reading has, has two, has two um, narratives and, and, and has two frames uh, and, and uh, trends that result eventually in that, in that conflict. First, something that I started with, that was the story of the disintegration of the Soviet Union or disintegration of the Soviet empire. And the second one was the, the nuclear story, the story of Chernobyl, and then the story of disarmament of Ukraine. The story of the fall of the Soviet Union acquired, acquired um, a new, new dimension, I would say, with the publication by President Putin in July of the last year, the article on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, where the um, goals of the Russian foreign policy, its attitude toward Ukraine, and eventually foundation, legitimation, but also foundation for the thinking about the future war was presented in the imperial terms. Because what Putin did, he went back to the writings of the uh, Russian political thinkers and philosophers and historians and writers of the Imperial Russia, pre-1917, borrowing from there the idea of the existence of one big Russian nation where Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians are one and the same, and used that, that uh, um, theory, that, that concept, that idea, as uh, again, as I said, legitimation for the war that was coming, but also the, the foundation for his own thinking about what the relations between Russia and Ukraine should be. It is on the basis of that misreading of history is that the plans for the war in Ukraine 
The idea is that Kyiv would fall within the few days or within one week, that the Ukrainians would welcome Russians as liberators was based. So it wasn't just a smoke screen. It wasn't just a legitimation uh, tool. It was also a manifestation of Putin's own thinking, which really puts our story, the story of this war, not only in the context of the collapse of the Soviet Union, but puts it into the context of the long durée process of the collapse of the Russian Empire that starts in 1917 or starts in the middle of World War I and continues till today. Again, the new, the new dimension has been nuclear. Now, the war in Ukraine, the all-out war that, that started on February 24th of this year, went nuclear already on its very first day. When the Russian uh, uh, troops in at that point unmarked uniforms, so it was almost like uh, it was a repetition of the Crimean scenario of uh, March of 2014. So the troops in unmarked uniforms took over control over the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, the, the site, Chernobyl nuclear site. Uh, why was that done? Again, something that no one really imagined that that would happen. Um, there, there is a number of explanations. One of them is, again, a very, very plausible one about the, the possibility of the nuclear blackmail. Uh, but another, another explanation is very simple. The uh, Chernobyl zone, exclusion zone, was exactly on the way from the uh, Russian troops that were at that time located in southern Belarus as part allegedly of maneuvers and Kyiv that became the key objective of the Russian operations in the first days and first weeks of the, of the war. So the easiest way to get from Belarus for Russian troops was by marching through the, through the Chernobyl nuclear uh, exclusion zone, which then demonstrated actually complete complete disregard for, for safety and recklessness of, of, of the Russian army. Once the Russians were forced to leave northern Ukraine and Chernobyl, Chernobyl zone, it turned out that they were digging trenches right on the, on the border of the Red Forest. Again, everyone who watched HBO miniseries, apparently those soldiers didn't watch it, knew that you don't dig trenches in the, in the Red Forest or next to it because that, um, that, 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 will come, that, that, that will come certainly with a prize. But one thing that changed immediately, and that was that the war for the first time in history came on the nuclear site. And the nuclear site was used as a, as a battleground or as the way through which the um, uh, troops and, and equipment and so on and so forth could be transported to, to the front lines. The detectors, the nuclear detectors in the zone immediately uh, reported, uh, registered and then reported the dramatic rise in the level of radiation. And it was not clear for the first few days what was going on. Then it turned out that the heavy equipment, the tanks and other things that the Russians were moving through the zone, they raised the, the, the dust, the radioactive dust from uh, in the zone, uh, increasing the level, the level of radiation. So, that was that, 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 that was the first scare. The second one came when uh, the um, uh, power lines, the ones that were bringing electricity to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant from outside were damaged. The functioning of the uh, safe confinement over the fourth uh, block of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant needed, needed electricity. To, to, to function properly. But more importantly, the last Chernobyl reactor, reactor number three, that was shut down in uh, the year 2000, the spent fuel assemblies from that reactor, 
they're still located on the territory of the Chernobyl, um, of, on the Chernobyl zone. In the uh, um, cooling ponds, which need new water and fresh water to cool them down, uh, to cool them all that uh, keep the temperature down. Otherwise, they get overheated and that, 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 that would produce, produce uh, another release of radiation. Now, this uh, water is supplied by pumps. Pumps need electricity to work and to function. The Chernobyl nuclear plant is not there anymore. It can't produce electricity. You need electricity coming from outside. The actions, the military actions in the area cut off the lines, putting uh, the, the staff which worked as a hostage on the, on the territory of the, of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in extremely difficult situation, they had to use the, the um, backup generators uh, that, that were working on diesel and so on and so forth. The Belarusians, the allies of Russians got terrified and said that we'll provide our own lines and our own, uh, own electricity to keep those pumps working. So it didn't, it, uh, it, it, at the end, the Ukrainian uh, uh, crews were able to, to restore the supply of, the, uh, of electricity from the outside of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant and the, the accident that was in the making uh, didn't happen. But that was exactly, exactly the um, scenario that then would start to develop uh, in Southern Ukraine at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe with six reactors. Again, at, the, at this point, those reactors don't, don't, don't work. Uh, they're, they're all shut down. But the uh, uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant was taken over in early March as the result of a military attack, shelling of the nuclear power plant. And one of the buildings, uh, the, the uh, training center next to one of the reactors of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant catching fire. Uh, that was the, the situation where the first time really in history, the war was waged on the territory of the function nuclear power plant. We had situations not of that kind in the late 70s and early 80s, where the um, bombing of the uh, reactors that were suspected of the production of the plutonium were taking place in the Middle East. The Israelis were bombing, the Iranians were bombing Iraqis, the Americans were bombing Iraqis, and so on and so forth. But those were the military reactors producing or suspected of producing plutonium. Those were not civil nuclear power plants. Two cases there were in, in uh, the, the, the history before, before Zaporizhia, where the um, nuclear power plants were taken over by the so-called uh, guerrilla forces. One time it was in Latin America, another time it was in South Africa. In both cases, the reactors were still under construction. They were not working. So the Parisian nuclear power plant is the first time in history where the war is being waged on the territory of the nuclear power plant. Um, the uh, major, the major um, concern for the for the um, possible accident at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Uh, is that the Chernobyl type of a situation can, can repeat itself. With all the reactors being shut down, the nuclear power plant needs outside energy, outside electricity to keep the uh, fuel within those reactors uh, on a certain level in terms of the temperature. If the electricity is not there, you get a situation of Fukushima. So not of Chernobyl of 1986, but of Fukushima, because the explosion and, and radiation that was released at Fukushima, they are not uh, linked to the, to, um, it's, it's not a Chernobyl type of, of an accident where something went wrong with the, with the operation of the reactor. The reactors were all shut down even before the tsunami wave hit 
the nuclear power plant. They were shut down as part of the standard procedure after the accident. But the tsunami destroyed the power lines that were bringing electricity outside electricity to the plant. The plant was not producing electricity anymore and the reactors got overheated. So we had the similar type of a situation or close to that in Zaporizhia a few weeks ago, where the, the, uh, because of the, of the war, war actions and war activities in the region, the, the power was, uh, was cut off. Another extremely important part of the uh, of the, um, the this dangerous situation that emerged in Zaporizhia and continues till today is uh, the fact that the operators of the nuclear power plant are taken as hostages. Um, the uh, many many people left the city of Enerhodar. Many people don't work at the nuclear power plant anymore. Uh, they, those who are left uh, really are exposed to the level of stress that is absolutely, absolutely unacceptable in the nuclear industry. Chernobyl accident or the accident at Three Mile Island or other nuclear accidents were happening without bombs being uh, or, or the missiles exploding next to the reactors without the men in the military uniforms with arms in their hands being present in the operational uh, halls of the, of the uh, or rooms of the uh, nuclear power plant. So that adds a lot, a lot of pressure, which means that people can, can, may mistake, can make mistake. And that's, that's another, another big issue. And the third one directly linked to the to the war and the way how the Russian Federation conducts this war. This is, of course, all on the top of Butcher and Zoom and, and other things of this demonstration of this barbaric way of, of fighting the war. But this nuclear barbarism and nuclear blackmail is certainly part, is certainly part of, that, of that bigger story. So the nuclear power plant built in the way that outsiders really can't get in. It's built in the way that it's the closest to the modern fortress that you can imagine in terms of the architecture of the enterprises or architecture of, of, uh, of the cities or towns. So it is a very convenient, convenient um, location for the troops of any country, in this particular case of the Russian Federation, to get inside of the walls of the nuclear power plant and being protected by them. The idea that this is a nuclear power plant also protects them from the attacks and missile attacks and artillery attacks of the Ukrainian army. And what we see starting in July of this year, once the Ukrainians started to talk first and then making this build up and preparation for the counteroffensive in southern Ukraine, is that the uh, Russian forces would, that were based at the nuclear power plant would leave its territory, fire missiles across the Dnieper River to the city of Nikopol and others, and then immediately get back to the into the safety of the nuclear power plant. So what, what we know today in July, Ukrainians started to use the, the um, um, drones to attack the Russian forces outside of the plant. And an appeal went on the social media to the Ukrainians in the region, asking them to find the way to inform the Ukrainian armed sources when the artillery and missile and other units were leaving the premises of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant so that the Ukrainians could hear them outside of the plant. So one way or another, the plant found itself in the middle, in the middle of the war zone. And uh, the uh, developments already in August and in early September demonstrate that there is a shelling of the, of the nuclear power plant. Uh, President Zelensky stated more than once that he looks at that as a, um, a Russian blackmail. And the blackmail is about the uh, future or the, the already happening counteroffensive of Ukrainian forces in the South. 
So Russia is trying to use the nuclear power plant the same way how it is uses referendums or wants to use referendums to claim this territory to force Ukrainians for a ceasefire where the territory that is now under Russian control would remain under the Russian control. And the blackmail addressed is not only to the Ukrainians, the blackmail certainly is addressed to the West with the idea that if you keep and continue support Ukrainian arms effort and so on and so forth, you can get another Fukushima or another Chernobyl in the middle, in the middle of Europe. Uh, where does this leave the world? Uh, one thing, and, and you probably recognize, if you don't recognize, there is uh, uh, Rafael Grossi, the, the, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, stands like a, like a um, Star Wars character. In, in, in front of the of the commissioner delegation that that was going to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Uh, well, the, the 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 behavior of the Grossi and International Atomic Energy Agency is even half not as heroic as this this image might suggest. For the first uh, ten days, approximately, the International Atomic Energy Agency was issuing after the takeover of Chernobyl, was issuing statements in which the agency called on both sides to exercise caution in what was going on. So the word Russia was not mentioned once in the first week or the, the first 10 days of the, of the um, uh, offensive and, and takeover first of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant and then of, uh, of site and then of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. This is despite the fact that the first news that came from Chernobyl uh, in February of 24th and February 25th uh, didn't identify the force that took over the Chernobyl nuclear site. According to the, to the official, to, to the information including coming from Ukraine, those were people in unmarked uniforms. So theoretically, it wasn't even any particular country that took over Chernobyl. Those were uh, unknown, maybe terrorist organization. Of course, everyone knew what was going on, but that's that 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 that, 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 that that's how it at least in terms of the official representation, the the, the um, knowledge that was there was presented. Why why International Atomic Energy Agency was so shy? Again, it, 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 it voice becomes, would become stronger and stronger in the months, in the months to come. But the original response uh, is related to a simple fact that the International Atomic Energy Agency is ill-equipped to deal with the situations like that. It is part of the United Nations structure in which Russia and the Rus Russian Federation is the member of permanent member of the Security Council. Um, I was I had a conversation with students before that, and there was a question about nuclear. So, guys, I'll repeat a little bit for a broader audience what what we had discussed, uh, what we discussed before. So, um, the, the the reason is that the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency really depends on the funding coming from Russia. The uh, future and re-election of Mr. Grossi depends on the position of the permanent members of the Security Council, including Russia. Uh, his ability to pay members of his team, this and its multi-multi-thousand uh, team in Vienna and in other places depends on the countries like Russia continuing contribution to the, to the organization. Um, when uh, International Atomic Energy Agency in 1986 signed off on the Soviet version of the accident in Chernobyl in December of 1986, the Soviet Union paid all its dues for the previous five or six years that it didn't pay to that organization in recognition of the, of the cooperation and understanding that was reached with the, um, uh, with the organization at that time. Uh, 
the situation is is even worse than that if you look at the um, legislative base and the international agreements that exist today on the basis of which the organizations like uh, IAA can function or cannot function. The most important document uh, on the war, on the conduct of the war and nuclear power stations comes from the year 1979, in which the, um, there is no a separate paragraph on the nuclear power stations. They are treated together with the uh, hydroelectric power stations and dikes. And the, the uh, norm is that it's, it's prohibited to attack that sort of a structures in the conditions of the war. But if the other side uses those sites for the military purposes, then the attack on the dike, on the uh, hydroelectric power station and nuclear power station can be justified which theoretically means that Russians by taking over the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant don't violate any international agreements unlike the Budapest memorandum with the war. There, they don't violate any international agreements because there always an argument can be made that the nuclear power, that the, that the electricity produced by the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant is used to light the bulbs in the barracks of the Ukrainian army. In, in, in this area or in that, and in that sense is used for the, for the military purposes. So the, uh, when I said that that was for the first time that the war really comes to the nuclear sites in, uh, uh, not just in Ukraine, in the world, what that really meant, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that when, when I came up with that formula, what that really meant was that the world in general is not prepared to deal with that at all at all, either when it comes to the international agreements or when it comes to the institutions that can, can deal with the possible accidents. In the last, in the last uh, few days, there was a very positive, uh, positive development and very positive signs coming from New York in particular where um, Grossi Guterres met with the, uh, with the um, Ukrainian um, prime minister and foreign minister at that time, and uh, a number of countries, including Canada, uh, signed a document uh, on the um, uh, creation of the no fight and no flight zone over the Parisian nuclear power plant. It's a very positive development, but, the Ukrainians were asking about that already in early March of, 19, of, of 2022, at the very start of the war. And that idea was getting actually no response and no traction either in Vienna or in other capitals. So we will see what, what, what will happen next. I, I am cautiously optimistic, but I also have serious doubt that Russians actually would agree to to um, first declare and then and then turn the the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant or any nuclear power plant into into a no fight no flight zone, and the latest news that are coming from the region was it seems to me two or three days ago a Russian missile uh, ending up uh, a few hundred meters away from the South Ukrainian nuclear power plant in Ukraine. Uh, no, um, it's it's uh, north uh, north of Mykolaiv. So where where does this leave us? What, if anything, can be done about about this situation, about the uh, use of the of the nuclear site as as form of the conduct of the war, as form of the blackmail? Where does uh, Vladimir Putin's latest latest uh, declaration that uh, mm, there will be referendums that will be part of the Russian territory and that the Russia is prepared to defend its territory with nuclear with nuclear power leaves us? Well, uh, we are back in many ways where I started this this. Um, mm, uh, discussion, at least uh, chronologically, we are 
very much back in the times of the Cold War. Which means that uh, the, the threat and nuclear threats associated with the Cold War are back. But also what that means is that some of the know-how that allowed the world to avoid the nuclear exchange and nuclear war can be, can be revisited and can be, can be looked again and maybe used, used for that very same purpose again. Uh, for uh, the uh, repetition of the Cold War scenario in which the nuclear war was avoided, it's very important to keep in mind two, two concepts that under, uh, had underwritten the, the, the uh, nuclear story, nuclear history of the Cold War. One was something that uh, Winston Churchill called already in the mid 1950s after the mm, mm, test of the first hydrogen bomb, he was talking about the balance of terror in Europe. But uh, the balance of terror, it's not just about the, this side having this nuclear weapons and nu this nuclear capacities and, and another has either more or has less. This is also about how this, this threat is perceived. And at this point, we are in a situation which is very much not like the Cold War one, in which Russia has the capacity, which is not superior, let's say, to the United States or to the combined, combined force of others. But it has a monopoly on the, on the nuclear blackmail. The fear, it has a, a monopoly on, 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 on threatening other powers and other countries with use of the nuclear weapons. And what is important in that, in that situation is actually switch and go from the balance of terror to the balance of, of fear and state very clearly to, to Russia and the Russian Federation much more clear than it has said today that if Russia uses nuclear weapons, it becomes a legitimate target for the nuclear attack. Because if, if there is no understanding that the use of the nuclear weapons comes with a response of the same kind, there is no understanding of the sort that there was during the Cold War, what we are, we are all at the mercy of the guy with the nuclear bomb that blackmails us. With regard to the, to the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant a, and use of the atoms for peace as atoms for war in this kind of conflict. Uh, Russia should be let known that whatever happens at the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant, it is taken over in the hostile way by the Russian armed forces and the Russian armed forces and the Russia is responsible for what is happening there. There is no similar situation at the uh, Rivne nuclear power plant or other nuclear power plants in Ukraine. There is no bombing, there is no shelling, there is a solely Russian responsibility for that. And if something happens there, Russia should bear full responsibility for that. Including, including its membership as a permanent member of the Security Council in the United Nations. Because that position and that chair was inherited by the Russian Federation, when in reality, according to the law before 1991, it really belonged to 13 other republics. Ukraine and Belarus were members of the UN on their, in their own right. But 13 others, they shared that common chair, which went to Russia on the right of the imperial succession to the Russian empire and then to the Soviet Union. And it comes with responsibilities for the non-attacking uh, nuclear, uh, non-nuclear states. It comes with the responsibilities of not waging the war. It comes with a lot of responsibilities. And until the will, or there is a very clear message, both in terms of the use of the nuclear weapons and in terms of the responsibility for any accident, any whatsoever happening on the nuclear sites occupied by the Russian Federation. I basically see continuation of the situation that we have today. 
when we are all blackmailed and we don't know what to do and how to respond to that. Uh, I wish I could end on a more uplifting note, but at least I tried my best to, to point into the direction or to, 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 to show the, the way forward, at least one of the possible ways. And uh, uh, I, uh, I uh, want to, to reiterate that these threats are real and they're not, they're not in the past. Future can actually bring even, even more dangerous situation that we are in today. Thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to, to answer questions if you have any. There's hands up, but we're using cards. Thanks everybody. Cards, there's someone to collect the cards. But first of all, it comes to me to thank Professor Plucky for an incredible talk and providing an enormous amount of context that even, you know, I'm an expert on Ukraine, but you brought a lot of uh, perspective, particularly when we talked about the 1990s, which is not something that always comes clear when you read the media. It tends to focus on 2014 forward or even more 22, but to bring in the 1990s is exceptional. I have one question for you, but I'm gonna probably do it last because I want you to, I think a lot of questions are gonna be contemporary. I'll take a look, but I'm gonna bring you back to being a historian like me, but we'll do that at the end because I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm a committed reader of the Financial Times because that's one of our, but I so enjoyed that lunch you had with the FT. So I wanna come back to some of the issues you, you raised. And the food was good too. Uh, yeah, I saw you, if I ever recall, you were in a, Pol is that correct? You were in a Polish restaurant in London. Okay, so first question, the cards are here. Okay, and I've got a lot of questions. We're going to go for about Professor Schatz about half an hour. That sounded about right. And then we have a reception. As, as Professor Schatz said, we have books for sale in the corridor, and we only have 50 copies. So just keep that in mind. Okay, 50 copies, and uh, Professor Plucky is here to sign them for you. First question, what would be a potential consequences if Ukraine didn't agree to give away nuclear weapons in 1994? Actually, that's something Alex Toshkov and I, who's back there, we're talking about, about you mentioned that you know there were options there, but what would have been the consequences that they said we're not going to play ball in this circumstance? Well, um, I uh, personally believe that um, they were not in a position to withstand the pressure coming from the two uh, countries at the same time. That was one of the rare cases in the post. Uh, Cold War era when uh, the United States and Russia uh, uh, acted together as one front uh, applying pressure to Ukraine. So you had a global superpower and you had a regional, regional power going against Ukraine. Uh, in 93 and 94, when the statehood is not, uh, is not really um, solidified, the nation is in the process of making, and it's the lowest point in terms of the economic, economic downturn after the end of the Soviet Union. So the, the option would be going the uh, Northern Korea path, being, being a pariah in the international community. And I don't think that that was the option that would benefit, would benefit Ukraine. Uh, but uh, uh, Ukraine was taking advantage in, in, uh, by being forced to sign non-proliferation agreement as non-nuclear state and then signing the Budapest Memorandum with, uh, without providing any meaningful uh, guarantees for, the, for its safety. It, it turned out it was really wallpaper, I called Budapest Memorandum wallpaper, that's probably given too much, too much credit to that document. We can, we can look for other, for other ways to characterize it. Okay, thank you very much. Another big, by the way, almost all the questions are asking that same question. So if you're thinking about a question, don't ask that question, because I've got about nine questions, the exact same question. You know, what were the options in 1994? Well, I, well, let me see whether I can provide different So maybe, get, okay, I'll keep reading them. <laughs> To what extent was Putin's foreign policy always irredentist towards Ukraine? And again, that takes us a little bit back, but but you know, prior to this uh, this this essay that he wrote last year, 
Um, well, uh, my reading of the of, um, of Putin's foreign policy is that it's it's a, a really a, a combination of a number of uh, different visions. The vision is one: restore in one way or another the Russian control over the post-Soviet space. But then the models the models would be different. The uh, war in 2014 starts over the issue of Ukraine insisting on signing association agreement with European Union. Not membership in the NATO, not membership in the European Union, not candidate uh, member status, association with European Union. Why it was so important for Russia? Because if Ukraine becomes associated or signs this agreement with the with European Union, it can't become the member of the Eurasian Union that Putin is building. And the Eurasian Union, without the second largest part of the former Soviet Union, is not a viable project. The Soviet Union, I, I talked about that fell in 1991 on the issue of Ukrainian referendum. No other republic had a referendum. And Ukrainians, when they went to vote in December of 1991, they didn't answer the question whether we want the Soviet Union to be around or not. They answered the question whether they supported the decision of their parliament for independence mm -hmm. of Ukraine. But Ukraine happened to be the second largest Soviet Republic after Russia in terms of population, in terms of the economic potential. The Soviet project without second largest Republic, Russia was not interested in it. It was looking for a different, for a different way of control of the post-Soviet space. Once Putin is coming back with the, with the idea of the uh, Eurasian Union, again, its success, ultimate success depends on Ukraine. And union is needed for, for uh, Putin for the idea of the multipolar world to for Russia emerge as a, one of the poles on par with European Union and China, rising China in the East. So all of that at the end depends, uh, depends in 2014, 2013, 2014 on Ukraine. The, the union project doesn't work out. He goes for the, for the greater Russia idea, grabs as much territory as possible, tries to disintegrate uh, to um, this, uh, destabilize Ukraine and so on and so forth. So he, 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 kind of, he starts with the idea of union, then he starts with the idea of grabbing as much territory from Ukraine as possible and making the rest of the, of, of the country incapable of governing itself. Uh, so that's that's geopolitics, but then there is also his fascination with history yeah. and his role in in history. Uh, th there is this this uh, anecdote about um, uh, one of the of the uh, Russian uh, Russian uh, oppositional um, uh, journalists, um, the 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 uh, former uh, former. Um, uh, editor in chief of uh, Echo of Moscow, Echo Moscow, uh, who uh, uh, was called by by Putin at the time when he ended his two to uh, ten years as the president and was prime minister at that time, and he asked him what because the, 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 that person was a history teacher before that he said. What out of my two terms would actually end up in the history textbook for the for the high school? And uh, the answer uh, that was given was that, well, uh, maybe the the uh, reunification of the Russian Orthodox Church in, in in Russia and Russian Orthodox Church abroad. Putin said, and that's all. And then after after Crimea, he met again. Uh, that, that the gentleman and looked at him and said, and what will now go in the history textbook about Putin? So he is there obsessed with the idea of re recreating control over the whatever is the definition of Russian lands and uh, getting down in history. And uh, one thing that I can say, he certainly will go down in history. 
but certainly not in the way how he imagines. Way how he imagines. So since you brought up the the issue of history, and I'm going to come back to that Financial Times piece, where, you know, and again, this is one historian to another. There's a number of historians in the audience. You said that, and I like it because I've used it in a preamble to a class, by the way. But I have noted it was from you, not from me. But you Thank said you. that you know generals now you know generals nowadays don't just occupy territory; they need to occupy history too. So it's not just about turf. It's about history as well. And you noted that the role of a historian now is to defend your turf. So I'm wondering, given that comment, if you could give us a bit more context about what you meant about that vis-a-vis -vis the narrative that the Russian president uses to justify or rationalize what's going on in contemporary Ukraine now. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I... I uh, mm, mm, Really, and, and probably not, not just me, uh, I and a number of people whom I knew were felt really um, ambushed by, uh, by really Putin's advances first in, in the field of history with attacks on history, misuse of history. Uh, as mm, happened with his pronouncements, he started to talk about Russians and Ukrainians being one and the same people in, since 2013. Mm -hmm. He was together with Patriarch Kirill in Kiev at that time, and that's for the first time he he, he stated that on the made up they, they came for made up anniversary, 1,500 years of the baptism of Rus. Um, and then, then July of uh, 2021 article where he presents his histor historiographic arguments. And you, you really don't know what to do because uh, to go out there and engage him and, and start arguing with him, it's actually providing legitimacy to what he is saying. Mm -hmm. Because now we are, we are on par, right? Whatever he says, whatever I say, or what, what, whatever historians from the University of Toronto or other place uh, are saying. And uh, the, 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 the question is how, how to deal and how to defend your turf. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the turf, that means the academic standards, yeah. the academic standards of the field, the academic standards of the argument, the limitations that come with feeling this responsibility for the field in the world, which is basically a post post truth world, a world of alternative facts. So it's not just Putin, it's, it's generally the, the, the situation in which we occur and the, the attack under which the social sciences or humanities or knowledge, so-called the, the, the Harvard motto is that they're promoting good knowledge. So somehow they knew whenever they came up with the motto that there was good knowledge and bad knowledge. So how, how, how to defend the good knowledge? And again, you, you look for different ways how to do that, but you really, you really uh, are, are ambushed at that time. Again, Putin is part of that story, but it's, 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 a, much, it's a much broader story, especially, especially in the United States. Canada is a very sane country compared to, to some of its neighbors. Well, we've only really got the one, so, <laughs> but I, I hear you on that. Now I'm going to give you the question that everyone's going to ask, but no one can answer, but I'm going to give it to you anyway, which is, you know, which takes a kind of pessimistic view on, on, on what goes on in Russia. So if Putin in some way or another falls from power, can we expect, can't we expect a similar figure to replace him in Moscow? You know, by the way, I'm a firm believer, if you're, if you're a historian, you know, the, the only people who can get rid of the president of Russia is in fact the military. And that's that's from a close reading of the past. So I want to I want your so, so 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 you don't trust in the security. Services. The security, not as much as I trust the army. Oh, but yeah. we could talk about it later. Okay. Well, <laughs> we, we 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 can. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I I agree with you looking at that from the historical perspective because if you look at the end of the Russian monarchy, if not the end of the Russian Empire. It's the alliance of the military commanders and the Duma deputies that mm -hmm. convince uh, convince Nikolai II to step yeah. down, and then Beria is of course arrested by the military. So uh, there are at least two cases in in the in the Russian history slash Soviet history where the military, because the perception is that military in Russian history never intervene, 
they intervened at least twice. Yeah. So uh, again, historically, I think that's 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 the the the, the very 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 good argument. Uh, now, uh, in terms of uh, Putin and and what comes next, again, uh, probably political scientist or anthropologist or psychiatrist give will will give you a different a different answer. So. I'm a historian, and what we see is basically a pattern in, in, uh, in particular in the Soviet history and then in the Russian history, but in Soviet in particular. There is, a, after uh, any, any um, autocrat of any standing, st stepping down or dying or, or, or being killed or whatever it is, there is a period of relative interregnum in the uh, in the uh, Soviet history and Russian history that would last would last at least between three and five years. So mm, between Lenin's death in twenty four and Stalin's rise to power in twenty nine, it's five years. Between Stalin's death in fifty three, rise of Khrushchev to power in fifty eight, fifty nine, mm -hmm. so it's another five years. Uh, for Brezhnev to get to, to outsmart Kosygin, it took another five years to emerge as, as the sole leader of the Soviet Union in the early 70s. Between Brezhnev and Gorbachev, three, three and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what, what uh, Yeltsin was trying to do, he tried to, to solve the biggest problem that the Russian politics have. This is a succession problem. Ukraine solved it in 1994, the right elections, that there is a way, there is a mechanism that, that is legally recognized in the country. Russia never came up with it. Yeltsin was trying to produce one by uh, establishing the, the successor model, appointing Putin. And uh, Putin made a mockery out of it with, with poor Medvedev. Mm -hmm. So the, the 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 successor model is is certainly it's it certainly didn't work at least once, and that raises a lot of questions for the future. But what uh, what I certainly expect is that there would be a period at least of three or five years before the new leader emerges after after a figure like Putin. And the the scenario, the closest scenario for me, is uh, the death of Stalin scenario. Tra uh, uh, tragic comic, mm. like in the like, like in the movie, like in the movie, like in the death of Stalin. Uh, but generally, there is it's different from difficult for me to imagine another person replacing Putin and continuing his policy because it is so damaging not just to Ukraine and to the world; it's so damaging to Russia and its mm. its, its national interests. So, for power is highly personalized today mm. in Russia. So no one will have that amount of the of the uh, personal power and terror and fear spreading around mm -hmm. to conduct that policy after after Putin is gone. So I, I don't buy at all this ideas that okay uh, we, we, we should we should uh, uh, be very careful because there is a party of war. There are there are awful guys behind mm -hmm. Putin, much worse than Putin, and. We can we can uh, uh, be careful what you wish. Well, we saw all of these people uh, in the um, when there was uh, a TV um, TV coverage of the Security Council mm -hmm. yeah. making that decision. The, the 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 we saw what it looks like. That that that, 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 that that's how authoritarian authoritarianism looks like. There is no out there. No, no out whatsoever. No one. I'm going to, to a degree, keep in historian slash academic vein, because I have a question. I'm pretty sure it's from an academic. And by the handwriting, I think it's Alexander Toshko. But am I, Alex, am I right? No, he's got his question still there. <laughs> Professor Rubel, is this you? No. <laughs> Can it Maybe not... it's a medical doctor. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a medical doctor, indeed. Can it not be argued that Putin's Russo-centric narrative fit well with considerable parts of academia? Um, well, um, less less so than I would say twenty years ago. Okay. Uh, but um, academia, it's uh, in terms of conservatism, it's next only to the Catholic Church. <laughs> uh, it it it's um, because in academia it's generational change, right? It's 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 not. The, 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 the change of paradigm and other things, they come with the change of generations. It's, it's like in 
autocracy. The policy changes when the, 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 the ruler is gone and then the new ruler comes and then there is an opportunity to, to rethink that. So as, as a structure, it is a very conservative institution. And uh, what, uh, what the academia, um, again, the academic world, both uh, here in Canada and in, in, in the US are uh, trying to discuss now is the issue of the uh, so-called de decolonizing the, the Russian studies. Again, what that means, it's not clear yet that there are different approaches, but, but that's, that's a buzzword that is now out there. And the, the, the invitation to think and, and, and to suggest and to propose um, so maybe maybe we'll get a change even before the generation change. Maybe maybe we will we will change the paradigm. Well, I'm encouraging changing the paradigm. But now we're going to bring in something which we haven't. We've talked a lot about nuclear power, both in the civilian use and in, in, the, in the uses for war. But one thing we haven't mentioned too often is the question of oil. So this question is: you alluded. Uh, to stronger threats from the West could be a deterrent to nuclear proliferation, but such a stance ignores the reality of Europe's depending on Russian oil. Could you elaborate on this dimension of Europe-Russia relations? So it gets us, yes, you know, yes, us right to where we are now. Yes, 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 ab absolutely. And thank you for this question. Um, oh, the the uh, Russo-Ukrainian war uh, produced actually two quite conflicting conflicting impulses in terms of what, what to do with energy and uh, in particular in Europe. On the one hand, this is the story of the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant and the possibility of another nuclear, nuclear accident. The nuclear accidents, they're all local, but their repercussions are global. So um, it's uh, if, 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 wherever the next accident happens, the impact will be global. The Fukushima, the um, biggest impact in terms of the change of energy policy was not in Japan, but in Germany. They decided to go completely nuclear free. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that's one um, challenge that to, 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 to the existing policy on the energies. Another one is that the Germany going nuclear free made itself completely dependent on the Russian oil and gas, which, which was bad from the, from the point of view of the political climate, which was bad and is bad from the, from the point of view of the climate and climate change in general. So what, how, and again, that's the, this is not a unique situation. There is, if there would be simple solutions and just one message, how to balance this two, two impulses coming out of the war, the danger of the nuclear, uh, energy and then the danger of dependence and over dependence on the uh, on, on Russia and Russian oil and Russian gas. Um, well, the, the 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 solution is is basically very easy. It's it's what what your financial advisors are tell you uh, when they try to prepare you for retirement. Diversify, mm -hmm. right? So you can't you can't uh, do uh, go go all the way one way or another. Diversification is a very important factor. Another thing in terms of the nuclear, um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, big question for me is what to do with the investment into the nuclear into the future. But four hundred forty reactors that exist today. To a degree that they are there, they already did all the climate damage that they could do by mining and producing this and construction and so on and so forth. It's 20% of the electricity in the United States. I'm not sure what it is in Canada. It's 10% worldwide. It used to be over 50% in Ukraine, 80% electricity production in, in France. So we can't just shut them down like the Germans did, get hooked on the coal and the Russian gas. So the point is actually have, have a long-term strategy that would balance, balance different, sources, diff, di different sources of energy. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the lesson is that you can't, you, you, you can't make sort of a mistakes the Germans uh, made and, and overreact also to uh, to uh, to nuclear accidents. Exactly. We've got, as you can see, a lot of questions. We've got a few minutes left. 
I'm gonna have, I'm obligated, I think, to take something from the home audience. I I've always wanted to say that, by the way. This is the people who are, you know, in Zoom land. Okay. But, you know, I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase, you know, if, if you work at a university like this, and I'm sure you get to lots of calls and the, the media is always calling, you know, to get to comment. The, the big discussion today was, of course, this referenda. And I was reminded people that the Russians don't really care about what we think about their referendums. So, because they don't, you know, it's not, it's not being held for us. It's it's being held for a totally different purpose. But the other big conversation is, of course, uh, and you alluded to it in the talk, is this this idea of recruiting an additional three hundred thousand soldiers. And you also mentioned a much larger figure, which would mean increasing the army to a million people, which is you know which is possible given the size of the Russian reserve. What do you make of this call up, and what do you make of the response on the ground? Because here in North America, we tend to get excited when a thousand people show up on the streets, but I don't think a thousand people, to be frank, matter that much. Um, <clears throat> uh, people matter even in Russia. And uh, the, the uh, anti-war mobilization, if it, 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 if it will happen, um, that will be the, the, the key factor for the end of the war. Either it's, it's ended by Putin or, or, or without Putin. Um, the, the news that we are getting today, apparently that there were also protests in Chechnya out of all places. And Kaderov uh, immediately backed uh, and, and said that, well, Chechnya already fulfilled and over fulfilled its quota. So there will be, at least publicly, he's saying that there, is, there will be no new wave of, of mobilization on the top of, he, he presides really over extremely militarized society. So I don't know what, what that means and whether one should, one should trust the, him or not. Uh, but um, the, the uh, um, situation is that um, uh, uh, the only the only uh, force that that uh, would be able or capable to 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 stop this war uh, would be uh, would be uh, some form of discontent or at least at least the the potential of that discontent in Russia. Uh, that is that is the real threat to uh, to Putin's regime. Mm -hmm. It's not NATO. It, it's not nuclear weapons. From that point of view, Ukraine's democracy presented a much bigger threat to Putin than Ukraine's potential membership in NATO. Okay. So uh, the situation is not is, is not great. It's 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 not good. But if you think about about again as, as historians about the Cold War yeah. and the number of people that were in Moscow protesting the Czechoslovakia yeah. the Czechoslovakia invasion. But at the end, we, we saw the Soviet Union imploding from inside. From inside yeah. And uh, I, I just don't see another, another scenario with the, with the nuclear superpower called Russia, because a lot of things changed since the end of the Cold War. Uh, Russia today is not even one of the 10 largest economies in the world. Yeah, no, that's... But, there are still two nuclear superpowers in the world, mm -hmm. and it's the United States and Russia. Yeah. So that didn't change. So uh, we also we also have a, um, largest in 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 my understanding um, political uh, political uh, uh, migration or, or exile from Russia or live in Russia since uh, revolution and then World War Two. Mm -hmm. uh, that's 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 something that will have will have impact as well. Again, uh, that 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 size of political immigration outside of the borders of Russia, mm -hmm. it will have impact on what is happening in Russia well, as well. Yeah, you know, what's happening inside Russia yeah. exactly? Yeah. During your talk, you stressed that you know at least the rhetoric from let's say the West should be ramped up a bit. So one of the questions is is how far should the West go in terms of threatening a nuclear response? to a nuclear use of nuclear weapons by Russia? You know, how far do you want to take that? Well, again, the, the peace during the Cold War was maintained by the understanding that if you use nuclear weapons, you will get 
burned, mm -hmm. right? So it's not the, 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 the nuclear weapons per se that contributed to, the, to that long peace after World War II. It's the way how people thought about it and what the use of the nuclear weapons meant. Right. So the, 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 the way of the thinking and understanding that there are actually consequences is extremely, is, is extremely important part of not going nuclear today. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, what, what vocabulary should be used, uh, how often, and things like that. I leave that to my colleagues in the government and political science departments. Right. I'm a historian. But again, looking, looking at that from the perspective of the, of the history of the Cold War, that's the, 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 the technology itself uh, doesn't, doesn't do these things, what people think about technology or the weapons. Uh, either either provoke conflict or or uh, keep keep things from uh, escalate. Absolutely. So I'm I'm going to conclude the discussion with two questions that I'm going to kind of merge together. And just I don't know if you know, but you know this university has has done an enormous amount of coverage on Ukraine, and we believe it's one of our fundamental responsibilities is to keep people informed and keep a spotlight on Ukraine as as a person who studied the Balkans and mostly Kosovo, for example, you know, a huge, an enormous burden fell to a lot of us, which is so that people didn't forget what happened in Kosovo. Mm -hmm. And the, the trajectory of Kosovo from, you know, 1989 to 99 was a decade. But you had to keep the focus on, you had to keep inviting people from Kosovo here. And I think Canada played a, a very important role. Mm -hmm. Here we try, I think we do an enormous amount. As you might know, we host a number of students from Ukraine right now. I'm hoping quite a few of them have joined us tonight. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe you'll meet some of them at the reception. Uh, and as Ed said at the beginning, it's regrettable that we find this, but we're trying to do our best here. So I have these questions. I think one's from an academic and one's from a young historian. But And I'll read them both, and then we can conclude on that, because I think it's a... <laughs> Uh, it's to your point. You said that to refute Putin's historical narrative is to lend him legitimacy. Uh, why is it not? Uh, why is it not the role of the historians to speak truth to power when needed? All right. And then another question: How do young historians nowadays fight against Russian myths, especially about this, you know, so-called brothers' history in quotation marks, and win an information war with Russia? Mm -hmm. Nobody has an answer to that, but yeah. <laughs> you know. If, and then I'm going to ask you the really hard question, and then we're going to go to the reception. Okay, good. So, um, what stands between all of us and reception uh, is, <laughs> are, are my answers. I, I, I try to keep them really, really, really short. <laughs> short and brief, yes. Um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, speaking truth to the, to, 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 to the uh, power and, 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 and authority, um, yes, that's 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 certainly one one of the responsibilities of the academics in general. We we are even protected with tenure yeah. for, for for those purposes. Uh, so the question is basically the format and the way how you are doing that. And at least my my solution, and there can be other solutions and probably better or something like that. Uh, I am uh, uh, trying to talk about those issues, uh, including the ones raised by, by Putin, even before they were raised, uh, both through the, through the uh, books, articles, and interviews, and things like that. And uh, that's, that's providing, providing good knowledge for the, uh, for the society as a whole. Uh, and uh, uh, the second question was... Uh, hmm. Well, it's kind of young historians, you know. What what does a young historian do now to well, fight? Well, okay. To fight, but to fight an information war and counter okay. counter a narrative that is grounded in absurdity. Well, uh, one thing that I know um, people in Ukraine are doing, and and historians, not 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 so young, maybe, but they still believe they're young. Uh, <laughs> uh, is that uh, Ukraine found itself on the front lines of this? disinformation campaign even before Canada and the United States found. So the check, uh, check fact checking and, and all these things were already on the Ukrainian TV long before, before the concept, concept arrived in North America because the, the, those Russia tried those technologies on Ukraine first. And in Ukraine, there emerged a, a group that was called Lik Bez, so the, the liquidation of the uh, of uh, 
what is uh, anyone can help me link best illiteracy yes yeah. so in, in that's in, in that sense the, the historical literacy where uh, good uh, historians put aside the academic project for a while and and went into the trenches of this of this information war again doing fact checking in terms of history and trying to explain the history of, of, of the country the history of international relations and so on and so forth so uh, again that's 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 a very that, that, that's one way to deal with that another another uh, issue there is that um, again you all saw me struggling with how to show the, the image on the on the screen and someone helped me and my guess is that it was a younger person than I am. Um, my, my students asking me uh, today, can I point them to, to uh, some video materials and films and so on and so on Ukraine, on Ukrainian history, not just on Ukraine. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe this, maybe that, but but that kind of material, that kind of content, and that's 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 the 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 where the especially young historians can do things that maybe the 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 older generations are less less prepared or less comfortable in doing those things. So the, 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 this is the entire new medium that that we should be present and. Uh, Again, I know that there are different opinions about Yuval Harari, but he is, he is writing books and then he is producing videos and then he is also doing the, the, this kind of a, a visual books. Uh, uh, I think, I think that's, that's, uh, that, 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 that's certainly the future in many ways. The, the challenge is how, how to maintain the level of professionalism and the expertise and dedication to the to the principles of the profession when you go into the in, in, into the broader audience how not to lost that that the, 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 that foundation because you can get into the trenches of that war and never never get out never get demobilized so um, again that's 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 uh, uh, Again, one possible way to think about that question. Thank you. Thank you for that question, and thank you for for this reception and for this question. <laughs> Great question. So we're going, as you know, we're going to have. A, by the way, just you get to look at that. You what you see? What we're left with in the front. We have these screens here. I'm looking at the IAEA inspectors, yeah. <laughs> and they look like they should be working at a car wash. <laughs> so I'm not sure that this is you know what I'm you know, what I'm hoping. Right. If my hopes depending on that, then I think we're in trouble. Okay. <laughs> but uh, thank you everybody for joining us. As I said, you now have a nice reception for about half an hour. You have some books if you want, and to get a chance to talk to Professor Plocky. Professor Plocky, wonderful to have you here. Thank you.